six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the, the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting is recorded and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. We will begin with a roll call of ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge, me, I'm present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Here. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Maureen Pollock, planner, and Dave Wasevich, senior building inspector. Rob Mora, building commissioner, will be joining us in a little while. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting members of the board and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, public meeting and a public hearing on ZBA FY2022-11, Faring Sunset LLC, um, Thomas Reedy Esquire representing the, the applicant, requesting a special permit to allow the construction of two apartment buildings and four duplex buildings with a total of 17 residential units, including two affordable units on an approximate 2.04 acre property under section 3 3.01, 3.3211, 3.323, 5.0, 5.10, 6.29 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 164 and 174 Sunset Avenue, map 11C, parcels nine and 299, general residence RG and neighborhood residence RN zoning district. The next order of business will be general public comments on matters not before the board tonight. We will then have an administrative meeting where we will select the election of officers and then other business not anticipated within 48 hours and adjournment. 
The first order of business is ZBA FY 2021, Fearing Sunset LLC. Are there any disclosures? We have a long list of new submissions since our last um, meeting, and I'm going to try to identify what they are for the record. New submissions include a cover letter dated May 19th, a new sheet three dated May, uh, for, this is in a site plan, site plan sheet three dated May 13th, sheet four dated May 13th, sheet five dated May 13th, sheet six dated May 13th. L series, new L series drawings, sheet L100, L300, L400, L500. Um, new sheets for building type A, sheet G1A0, G10A, A01A, A11A, A12A, A21A. Building type B, apartment buildings, sheet, G, sheet G10B, A1, 1B, A0, 2B, A1, 1B, A1, 2B, A2, 1B. And a series of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 um, for building type C, all sheets G and A through uh, C. Um, we also have um, residential redevelop a new residential redevelopment management summary, um, a parking management plan, a new interior unit finish samples, a cross-section model, model views submitted May 26, 2022, fire truck exit circulation plan, and a fire truck entry circulation plan. Um, I think those, Maureen, I think that's all the new submissions from the applicant. Uh, staff submissions include the town of Amherst, um, it was already included from last meeting. There are this, a new Town of Amherst Local Historic District Commission Certificate of Appropriateness dated May 24th, and a new project application report updated of May 26, 2022. There have been three public comment submissions, one since our last meeting from Connie Gillen et al. I think there's about 57 uh, signatures, people signed on to that letter that was dated May 20th, 2022. Are there anything, is there anything else that I missed in terms of submissions? Great. Um, I want to announce what my intention for tonight would be. Um, I don't think it's going to be possible for us to be, to fully consider this application tonight, especially with all the recently um, received site plans, significant changes, progress on the application. Um, and I just, I, I'm not sure about everybody else, but it's been more than we could handle in the last couple of days. And that is not through any fault of anybody on this, uh, in either the applicant or the staff. There's just a lot of uh, movement and a lot of amendments to this project and just isn't uh, time to fully review them prior to this meeting. So that's the purpose of this meeting uh, is to do that. So at the appropriate time, I'm going to ask that this matter be continued until June 23rd. But tonight I'd like to accomplish a couple of things. I wanna make sure to give the applicant a chance to run through um, the changes that they've suggested, the things that they have um, responded to the questions that we had, but there's a, you all have received a series of, I think it's six or seven questions that uh, we submitted to the um, to the applicant, and then we have outlined what we'd like to have the applicant, how we'd like to have the applicant respond to those questions. So those include um, submit for the record, um, or take testimony from the applicant on an overview, a detailed representation. You've got this already in your in your in your packets, folks. Um, and the last thing I would like to say is, last meeting I asked board members to wait until the end of the whole presentation to come to ask their questions. And I found that that was probably um, inhibited the ability of people to ask questions just because it went on for, it was a large presentation, a long presentation, and it's just really difficult to remember what you were asking about before, you know, an hour ago. So uh, what I'm going to do is working with Mr. Reedy, 
I'll take a break at the appropriate time. You can ask questions about the subjects he's covered, and we can go and we'll re um, we'll begin again the presentation from the application. Um, otherwise, we're going to be waiting till the end again, and I think it's it's just very difficult to have a meaningful discussion at that point. So um, I think this this process has the potential of being really long if we um, have a lot of questions. A lot of questions are good, but we can make this as short as possible if both the questions and the answers are direct and succinct. So let's try to strive to do that so we can be done with this um, uh, hearing tonight by um, by 8.30 or quarter to nine so we can engage in the other business that we have scheduled tonight. So are there any other questions, are there any questions from members of the board about how, we, how we're going to proceed? Okay, uh, Mr. Reedy, uh, you're presenting for the applicant. Oh, Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think you're muted. No, you're not. Can you hear me? Okay, now. Now we can. Okay, now we great. Can hear you. You loud and clear. Great. Uh, so for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon, Wilson, and Amherst here on behalf of the applicant Fearing Sunset um, in, its app, in their application for uh, special permits for a residential redevelopment for 164 and 174 Sunset Ave in Amherst. Uh, with me this evening, Barry Roberts, who is the manager of Fearing Sunset, and I'll, I expect you to hear from him a little later tonight, Jonathan Salvon, the architect. Andy Bowen, landscape architect, and, and Maureen, I think Phil Henry should be in the audience. He's our civil engineer. We could just let him in. Um, and so, yeah, Mr. Chair, there's, you know, you, you read off uh, quite a few submissions, and I, I give a lot of credit to the development team because as we go through the changes, you'll see that I think they're all improvements. They're all relatively simple, but when you update one sheet, you end up updating all these other sheets associated with it. So that's why, you know, we don't just give you the site plan and the landscape plan, we give you every plan that these changes touch on. So that's why it might seem voluminous, but ultimately I think as you'll, when you see the changes or, or hear the changes, you'll realize that they're, they are pretty simple. Not that I'm expecting to get an approval tonight, but just for context, so it's not too overwhelming for everyone. Um, so we were last year, end of April, you mentioned that we received the historical commission um, demolition delay waiver so we can actually move relocate these houses uh, and move um, or, or move the houses and demolish parts of the houses. And then what also we've been doing is is really trying to take to heart what the board said what the neighbors said and so we've I'd say redesign the project uh, and I'll share my screen so you can see. So hopefully, can you see uh, a rendering of an aerial rendering? Okay, good. Um, and so what we did was, you know, the original proposal was for 17 units and 59 beds. So that was four two bedrooms, one three bedroom and 12 four, four bedrooms. And so, you know, Barry had met with the neighbors and we also heard some of the neighbors comments about the number of four bedroom units. And so what we did was we tried to take a look at reducing the number of four bedroom units and making a little bit more of a variety of units within the same footprint, because we have that local historic district commission certificate of appropriateness. And so we thought it was important not to change really the footprint of what we're presenting. As to footprint, we're about the same. The only change you'll see to the footprint of the buildings is this one right here. You may recall that in the previous iteration, it was actually, I'll call these segments. This is a segment, this is a segment. It was three segments long and we've reduced that to, to two segments. And what that's allowed us to do is you know, being sensitive to another um, comment was we're, we were able to put in a walkway with steps and a little LA, I think landscape architects would call it, to get back to this area. So if you're in one of these units, you don't have to travel all the way down here to get back to the amenity area. So in addition to that footprint change and the sidewalk change, the, the new proposal instead of 59 beds is for 53 beds. So it's a lesser amount of beds. 
and 22 units. So while the units increase, the beds decrease because the proposal is for four studios. And those studios, as you'll see when, when Jonathan presents, are located in effectively revised duplex buildings. So the footprint of this building and this building right here will each have studios at the bottom. And then we'll have one bedrooms on one side and two bedrooms stacked on the other side. And those are kind of duplicates of each other. So we end up with four studios, four one bedrooms, five two bedrooms, one three bedroom and eight four bedrooms. And so the, the four bedrooms would be located in this duplex, this duplex, this duplex, and then two of the units in this apartment up here. And so we think that, you know, we, we hope that, you know, the board and the neighborhood understands that, you know, we're, we're trying to listen to what they're saying um, to reduce those numbers, the number of four bedrooms. What that also does is because we have 22 units, we now have three affordable units. And, you know, frankly, I don't know if it would be a one, a two, and a three, uh, two studios and a one, two ones and a studio. We're, we're frankly going through this process of marketing or, or soon to be going through the process of marketing at one university drive south um, and then barry has 70 university drive and both of them there's a high demand for studios and ones um, so uh, you know i don't know probably by the next i would assume you're not closing the public hearing probably by the next hearing we'll have a better sense of what the affordables uh would be but just note that previous iteration was two affordable units this is three affordable units. So we increase the affordable units. In addition to that sidewalk change that I talked about back here by adding that now that walkway, what we've also done is in this area here, uh, we've pulled this sidewalk back because what we're doing is saving that public shade tree. And so the if you'll recall, the sidewalk went straight across because we had asked to take it down, but through discussions with the, the neighbors and ultimately talking with Barry and understanding, you know, the importance of this tree as it sort of sets a boundary for this neighborhood. We've redesigned this sidewalk to have it swoop down so that it doesn't impact uh, that tree or minimizes any impact to the tree. Um, and then I'd say two other changes, or maybe three other changes. One is the inclusion, and Barry will talk about this, the inclusion of an on-site management office um, and that's going to be located right here. And that, that manager is dedicated to this site. Uh, and so we think that whether it's tenants, um, tenant lease up, tenant complaints, tenant issues, maintenance issues, neighbor issues, et cetera, um, that on site manager will help. There still be, still will be professional management. Barry's still going to manage it. And then also we're going to have a resident manager. And again, Barry will explain that. But, but what will happen is, uh, and he has this at Seven University Drive. He reduces the rent for a responsible person. And they're the first point of contact, typically, whether they get the first call and call Barry or Barry will get the first call and then call them. You always have somebody you know, there at the site. So that's one of the other changes. Uh, we've also now have accessible units. We have a fully accessible unit. And, and again, we're not sure because I think that's going to play on what the affordable units are, but we will have one fully accessible unit. And then we're also, Jonathan will talk about, we'll have some group one accessible units. And you'll see there's now a walkway back here leading to these studios, which I believe are, would be group one accessible. You also see a sidewalk here, which would be accessible. Uh, and then lastly, I think what's not shown on this uh, diagram, because these renderings just take a long time to create because they're they're topographically sensitive and i'll go through them uh, so you can see them because i know that that was part of the request the latest iteration of the plan so barry met with uh, many of the neighbors many who wrote the letter and if you see from the letter um one of the requests from the neighbors was to close this access so not to have sunset avenue access so in the plan set that you have and i can probably flip to it you'll see that there is no longer any access to Sunset Ave from the development. Everything will come in and out of this Fearing Street entrance. And we should have, you'll see that there's landscaping. So the, the pavement will end about 
here. And we've got a, we've done a truck turn analysis to ensure that the fire department's largest truck, uh, I think it's a 48 foot ladder truck, would be able to navigate the site, would be able to enter and exit. Um, and so we've got landscaping shown here. Um, and so while on the rendering, you see that it extends all the way out, the proposal is not to extend all the way out. What that also does is changes the construction entrance so that everything is coming out of fearing. So even for construction, um, those construction vehicles are gonna be entering and exiting here. We're trying to minimize, you know, with the request of the neighbors, minimize the uh, potential traffic foot and otherwise, to the balance of the neighborhood. So, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think we made some really good changes. Uh, you know, the reduction of the four bedroom units, the reduction of bedrooms. Um, we've also reduced parking by one. We had 43 spots, we're down to 42 spots. And that's because even though there's a car shown here, um, this is hatched out because you'll see that that is providing kind of the access to the sidewalk and the steps uh, to access this amenity space. So we think there's better site fluidity, if you will. Um, and so we've, we've identified the visitor spaces, we've identified the compact spaces, we've identified the office space for that on-site uh, manager. You'll see the serpentine around the tree to save that tree. Um, and then, you know, one of the things I will probably show you, so I'll try to back out this, this will do a decent job of showing you what, um, what the site, this, like a section of the site will look like. But I think if I flip through, you know, a lot of credit to Andy Bones team for, for pulling this together. Um, so what they do is they lay it on top of the topography. And so you'll see the different, um, you know, back here, if you'll recall, there were those three segments. Now there's only the two and that's where we were able to add. And so here you'll start to see some of the topography. So this is at the intersection of Fearing and Sunset. You'll see how the sidewalk now serpentines around that tree. We've removed this transformer uh, and we're putting it between these two units and a second one between those back two units. So one of the comments last time was we'll take a look at the transformer. And so we've moved that uh, out of the way. You can see how everything slopes down. Um, this is a view from the entrance. You can see how it, how we enter and then it drops down. You can see the arborvitaes. And then this is from uh, across the street at on, on UMass property at their sidewalk uh, looking south into the project. These are the units near sunset. These are the units right in front of you. And you can see the gradation as it drops off. You can see behind it the retaining wall, if you're following my mouse, how it levels out here. So that's the retaining wall. And then you've got those arborvitaes that are blocking it. And then this is from the northwest corner of the site looking back. So you can see the exposed retaining wall. And then the grade change here. And then this is an aerial view, uh, that dumpster enclosure, uh, trash enclosure. This is that accessible path back to the amenity space. And then this is that other path back to those studio units that are, are down at this lower level. And so those would be, I think those group one accessible. We also have the stair and we have the, the bicycle rack. And then this is from ground level at that amenity space looking I mean, Fearing Street on the left, you've got the retaining wall here to give you a sense of, of perspective. And then this will be the height of, uh, you know, from the back, the buildings look three stories high, but from the front, they look two stories high. Uh, this is from the southerly end of the amenity space. You know, you've got those UMass towers in the background. You see the new uh, sidewalk coming down and connecting back to the amenity space. And then just a, an aerial raised view from about the same area. And then you can see probably the, you know, the heights, the peaks of these buildings in relation to the peaks of these buildings. So these are obviously a bit higher because just the topography is higher near sunset. Another aerial of the community garden and in, in the amenity space. 
of you into the amenity space. And I can go back to any of these if anybody has a particular interest. Um, here you see on sunset, and so you see the hedgerow, and you see the gates that we had talked about last time. You see the finishes of the building, um, the steps right going into the building. And then again, this is one uh, just really given the timing um, and frankly, the expense of putting these things together, we weren't able to show that this hedge will continue, but do know that's, that is the proposal that this access will not exist. The curb line will go straight across. The sidewalk will go straight across. We'll have grass here. We can probably even fit another uh, street tree here. We'll probably end up putting another street tree there. And then a couple of other, you know, rows of hedges. And then it would be uh, grassed until, you know, the balance of this bituminous concrete, um, you know, the paving would continue to exist and that would function as the truck turnaround. Again, from the amenity space now looking south, you can get a sense of the, uh, the topographical change from the parking lot down into this, you know, that, that additional tier, that third tier, if you will, and then again, standing by that new sidewalk that we've just added uh, as a result of changing the, uh, the building footprint. Um, thanks again to, you know, to Jonathan's work of, of figuring out how to make that a functional six unit apartment really is what those are gonna be. And then again, from the entrance, you get a sense of the topography. You know, it's, it's, it's probably not as dramatic as many folks would have thought because the site needs to remain relatively uh, level on the interior of the site, but you can see, you know, how the retaining wall will end up coming out of the ground here and then will be, will, will extend. And then just a couple of interior renderings from uh, one of those studios in the new apartments. And then on the second floor, looking out into that community garden space. And these are some of those front units. Uh, this is the one on the northeast corner. You'll see there's no longer a transformer. You'll see how the sidewalk meanders down and then comes back out for the protection of that shade tree. You'll see the defensible spaces in front of these units. You've got the step, the little stoop, and uh, the, the bump out. And these architectural features are all proposed as part of the project. And you've got um, the parking lot view. This is building three. So sunset is up here in front of this building. You've got that on-site office space, the, the office manager or the, the site manager right here. You've got a doorway. And I believe this one leads to um, the upstairs units. So we were able to, you know, through the discussions last time, we had talked about okay, folks park back here, are they going to have to walk all the way around to the front? And thinking that wasn't ideal, um, Jonathan was able to work in an internal staircase that he'll, he'll talk about when he goes over this building so that folks who park back here can access and actually get to their units because there's a two bedroom flat on, on the back, um, you know, on, on this in this area here. And again, the lighting that you see, the height of the lighting, the downcast lighting, the landscaping, the, the pedestrian lighting, you know, all of this, I mean, it's, it's painstaking to get through it, but it's, it's all what is proposed on the plan. So I think these are really useful. Uh, again, this won't exist. The sidewalk will continue. This will be grass and this will be the curb line and likely we, we can put in another shade tree if, if Andy tells me it's okay. Um, and then this is inside from the parking lot with all the grades. You can see where the fire truck turnaround. And, and what we'll end up doing is we'll sign this and stripe this so that it's you know no parking fire lane at the request of the fire department. And then another one. This is from across the street. This is um, this is the creamery building across the street. Again, this won't be here, but I think you get the sense of what the street streetscape. Uh, will be. If I'm boring anybody, please let me know. We've got 30 of these. Uh, we're almost done. This is looking back at the amenity space. Uh, again, community gardens. And then this is more ground level. Um, looking at that second, uh, this is a sixplex, this is a sixplex, and then this is a duplex. And then finally, from the, um, from the amenity space, looking out. 
And I think what I'd, I'd want to do is just talk a little about interior finishes. These are the types of finishes. We're looking at granite countertops, white cabinets, uh, LVL flooring. So it's, it's higher end finishes, stainless steel appliances, except for the washer and dryer. Those won't be stainless steel. We just, they kind of take a beating sometimes. Um, and hopefully the balance of the appliances won't. So this is, while this isn't the, the floor plan with, you know, um, the finishes superimposed, these are the types of finishes that, that we'll be providing. Um, we can talk about the, the rents and some, maybe some of the other answers. Well, well, let's do, you know, Mr. Reedy, let's, I think that was a really good overview. And so let's open it up for questions from the board about um, if there are any about the overview and the, the, the nature of the changes that you've made since the last meeting um, and the, the uh, bedroom mix and everything else. I think that's the appropriate time to do that. that and then great. we can talk a little bit about the management. Next, we could talk about the management plan and the management of the property, uh, resident manager, as well as the professional management. Then we can go on and talk about tenant selection and other things, but this is a good, good point for us to talk about um, the overall changes made since last time. Sure. I guess I, I, I would just start out. So you, you made a decision that um, you thought it was, um, would attract a certain type of um, tenant to, to increase the number of studios and one and two bedrooms and decrease the, the um, number of four bedroom units. Um, is that, was that your goal is to try to, to um, attract single professionals or what was your, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I want to let you tell me what your, your notion was behind that. Yeah. I think it was, you know, twofold. Um, one of them is listening to the neighbor's comments. I think, you know, Ms. Tob had a, had a comment about the number of four bedrooms and we heard it from some others. And so we said, okay, is there a way to reduce this? Because what, what we're trying to do is, is so housing is a need it's finding the right mixture of housing to get the right tenants in there in the dimensional restrictions that we're under. And so it's a kind of a numbers game to find and, and to make the project you know, viable because construction costs mm -hmm. now are incredible. So it was the neighbor comment. Plus, I mean, uh, one university drive South is all studios and ones. Uh, Seven university drive has studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms and three bedrooms. And so it was, and I'm talking to Barry, I think, and talking to the neighbors, he thought it was good to kind of diversify a bit more. And to a certain extent, you get some self-regulation when you have studios one and ones. Uh, and we increased the number of twos and we, we added studios and ones. Um, and so, yeah, we, we thought it would help diversify. And then we thought it was nicely balanced with the number of four bedrooms. Um, because, you know, to a certain extent, we don't necessarily think all four bedrooms are going to be filled. If it's a family, there could be a family of, of three, of, of four, you know, two parents, two children. They may take up three bedrooms and then having an additional space, office, or otherwise. And, and Barry, I'll tell you, there will likely be undergraduates here. And, and I think you saw from our, our management discussion, we're not excluding anybody. We're trying to select you know, lawfully the, the right people, and that comes down to management. But we thought that given the market conditions, given what we heard from the neighbors um, in, in the attempt to try to make it all work, I think that's why we went to more studio. We got some studios and ones in there. Are there questions from other board members about the, the changes, the overall approach, um, changes made since last meeting? Or any changes or any questions just about what what you see that's been presented so far mr meadows uh i curious how you're anticipating keeping um let's say visitors and students from southwest out of the parking areas I've noted every time I've gone down Fearing Street during uh, during the semester, it is completely parked up and people are looking for spaces. Um, have you got a thought on, on how you're going to keep those spaces that you're designating for tenants and visitors? 
in, in Barry, I'll ask you to jump in, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's just diligent management. Um, you know, so we have a parking management system. We'll have a sticker system for um, the residents. So they'll be able to, to affix that. Uh, and I think it's probably registration of, of visitors, you know, to a certain extent, visitors who are just stopping by for a short period of time is one thing. If we see the same visitor over and over and over, um, you know, I, I think then, and, and they'll probably, I believe it's in the lease and it'll be posted that, that those vehicles will be towed and Barry can probably tell you all it takes is, you know, towing a few times for people to get the message that this is a private parking area. Um, you know, we've thought about uh, putting a gate across there and have it access controlled. Um, that we can consider that, and I'll I'll have Barry think or talk about that. I don't know if that's a you know poses an issue for fire department access or emergency vehicle access or let's say Uber or Lyft access or delivery vehicle access to try to get in there, which I suppose that it would. So I think it's just diligent management. And Barry, I don't know if you've got. Any other comments on on how to deal with that? I think what uh, works for us at uh, say Barry. I, just I don't want to interrupt you. Just put, give us your name and address for the record. Barry Roberts, two hundred Bay Road, Amherst. Thank you. What works at uh, Seventy University Drive is we everybody that has a vehicle is registered. Uh, we ask them to talk to the office if they're going to have a visitor. Like some um, some of the parents are from overseas and they might come to visit their children. At times we've had that and they actually stay with their children for a day or two and they have a, have a car or a rental vehicle. So with the person being on site, excuse me, at this project, they'll be able to keep an eye out on the parking. And uh, Tom's right, you tow once or twice and the word spreads like wildfire. So um, I think we're able to control that very easily. I know one of the things I, I wanna talk about and I want you to kind of talk a little bit more about in the next um, segment is the management and the different roles of the the three management functions, property management functions you have. Um, but I think that's the place where you can go into more detail about the um, on-site management. Um, does that answer your question, Mr. Meadows? I think so. Ms. Parks, I see you had your hand up. Um, were there any uh, pictures that showed the um, entry uh, from Fearing Street? You're looking at it. Uh, Okay, so where's the parking like along? Oh, this, okay, I get it, okay. So Sunset so I think is here, right. Fearing is right down here. Your back is, um, there's there's a bunch of condos kind of kitty corner across the street. Your back's to them and you're looking into the, into the site. Okay, so and right now, so there's there's parking spaces that go up to like where this guy is standing. No, the parking right space, now. we're not touching the parking spaces. Okay. I get to here. So you, you'll you see right here, that's where yeah. those parking spaces end. Okay. okay. And those are the existing parking spaces and we're not, we're not touching, we're not removing them, we're not touching them. Okay. And how many people can live in a studio apartment? I mean, under law, I think it's up to four because it's a unit, okay. um, but, you know, practically, I would imagine one, maybe two. Okay. That's that's what I had. Great. Are there other questions? Just want to write down a question for later. Um, okay. So next, Mr. Reedy, um, can you talk a little bit about um, the three roles? I think this is new, the three roles of management. You've got a, a professional management firm, you've got on-site management staff, independent of the resident manager who's also on-site. So what's the coverage? What are the different roles? How do you, how does this, how do you view this? And has this been done in other projects before? 
yeah, and, and maybe the best way is I'll put Barry on the spot again. Uh, but this is effectively how he manages. Um, and so Barry, maybe just talk about, you know, you as the professional manager and then the on-site management and then what you've done to get resident managers and, and just how it all works. Sure. Um, I'll try to. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, so the way um, I see it and the way we handle that 70 University Drive, um, we have uh, designated a resident that we adjust their rent and they are eyes and ears on the project for us when we're not there or if there's somebody that's locked out of the building and lost their keys or something like that, and they contact me, I would call them and they would go take care of that. Uh, if there's an issue that they see on site, like a party starting to amp up or something like that, they would call me and I wouldn't put them in the danger of addressing that. I would go there or one of the other owners would go there. So uh, it's worked very well for us uh, since the day we opened. Uh, we, we have done it that way. There is also the same situation that exists here where during working hours, five days a week, there is a staff person on site and they are processing while they are there, they're processing applications. Uh, and also they're there if a tenant has an issue with a washing machine, a toilet, anything like that, they're able to handle that. And they know who our subcontractors are and they can call directly to handle that right away. Um, also, they would be there to address the parking and keep an eye on that. So um, I kind of think that I function as you know, like I told the neighbors when I met with them, um, my phone number is available all the time. Uh, and if I need to go there, I will go there. Um, I also am notified anytime there is alarm, say a smoke detector goes off, they're all monitored. I'm notified and I can uh, usually go there if it doesn't address itself fairly quickly, I go there and find out what's going on, whether it's somebody smoking illegally in the building or they burned the bacon or something like that. But it's worked very well at uh, 70 University Drive. I think Tom alluded to the fact that that project is about 50% undergraduates and we have not had an issue there. I think you could check the police logs uh, if you wanted to, but we have not had an issue at 70. Uh, it's a wonderful mix of professionals. Um, we, we also have affordable units there. Um, and it just seems to self-regulate very well with, with us paying attention to what's going on on the site. So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. So in a, it, we've got you would you're proposing to have somebody 40 hours a week nine to five on the property as an employee of the ownership company and then the resident manager uh when they're there on the at nights or on the weekends or would, would also be a contact person and is the role for essentially the role of the resident manager to replace aside from the administrative functions of tenant selection and everything else but in terms of tenant interface to, to replace the role of the, the um, uh, on-site manager when the on-site manager is absent at nights and weekends? Um, actually, we have a, we work with a software system that allows uh, at any time for people to put in a complaint like the toilet's not functioning or things like that. So I would see the, the uh, let's call it after hours manager or on-site person as do, I want somebody to be there to see if a party's starting to fire up or something like that, or there's uh, other problems on the site. I don't expect them to feel uh, complaints about the toilet not working. 
or things like that. I mean, if there's water running all over the floor, of course, uh, I would ask them to go see what's going on and let me know so I can get there and take care of it or, or contact the appropriate subcontractor. But I, you know, I'm not expecting them to be a maintenance man. I'm expecting them to, you know, let people in with locked doors. Um, he will get to know, he or she will get to know everybody on the site and will let people in appropriately if necessary. Thank you. You know, I think one, if I may, I think it might be really helpful, Mr. Reedy, to have a narrative that describes these um, these roles a little bit more. I mean, I, I understand your, what you created in the um, submissions briefly describes the different roles, but I think what uh, Mr. Roberts has gone through makes it much more clear to us how they intend to do that and building upon the experience in at 70 University Drive and what how he's, what he's just talked about. It'd be very helpful to have that um, delineated in the management report or management plan. And I think that's something you could do without, um, I would like to see that in the management plan. Sure. That'd be great. Oh, I, I see that Rob Mora has joined us. I just want to note, but for the record, uh, the building commissioners joined us as well. Any other questions for, from members of the board um, so far? Mr. Mora. Uh, thank you, Mr. Judge. I just wanted to mention to the board um, related to this discussion that the, the zoning bylaw does have a definition of resident manager. Uh, so a resident manager is required in certain situations, not owner occupied duplexes being one of them. Uh, and it does come with a definition that uh, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, read part of it here. Uh, a person qualified and responsible for the implementation of the property management plan and for managing and coordinating maintenance, housekeeping, and administrative duties. So I just wanted the board to be aware of that. And, and I understand uh, Mr. Roberts, um, you know, has a, a, a thorough management plan that involves multiple components, but I just wanted you to be aware of the typical resident manager uh, requirement uh, does carry a definition that sounds like maybe it's not the individual that Mr. Roberts just described, but perhaps is covered by the, the variety of services that uh, is offered uh, being proposed for this site. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mora. Mr. Reedy, one of the other questions we asked was an overview of the tenant selection process, procedures, and ongoing monitoring to ensure a mix of tenants as desired by the applicant and outlined in the management summary. Can we, um, can you give us an, an idea of, or go through tenant selection process, how you try to match the tenants with the neighborhood and everything else? That would be very helpful. Yeah, sure. And so, you know, one of the things, um, to start out with is there there are affordable units and there's a whole separate process for the affordable units there's qualification um, by income level and then there's a lottery process and then there's the typical vetting of um, you know reference checks credit reports etc but but the affordable units are regulated somewhat differently because it's it's actually under a regulatory agreement with the Department of Housing and Community Development that the municipality of Town of Amherst also signs. So those are, are regulated just a little bit differently and you're not uh, as free just to you know find somebody on the street and say, hey, do you wanna live here? It's, it's a pretty highly regulated tenant selection process. So for, for market rate, and, and this is the lawyer in me, I'm always, you know, what I always tell clients is be consistent because you, you wanna be very careful about not discriminating. Um, and so tenant selection, as long as you go through the process similarly for, for everyone and you're not discriminating based upon real or perceived class, then you're gonna be okay. And so, you know, and as I put in the narrative, um, you know, tenant selection almost starts with design. I, it, it comes down to, how you lay something out, the quality of finishes that you have, because if, if you kind of design a dump or maintain a dump with all due respect to dump owners, you're probably gonna get tenants who are not gonna respect the property. 
And so it's, you know, part of the process we went through here was to design something that would get folks in here who have the sense of community and respect the property. Because I think that's probably the, those intangibles, if you will. Um, and so once you get site layout, finishes, amenity spaces, et cetera, then you go to marketing because not only, now you've formed the place and then you try to figure out, okay, how do we get the people in here? And, and you don't necessarily post it on the tack boards at UMass. Um, I can tell you for one university drive South, many folks who have come to seven university drive. Uh, I think, you know, there was the assistant lacrosse coach recently. We said, you know, not me, but it was said, Hey, check out one university drive South because it's similar finishes, similar management, similar tenant type, similar respect of the property. And so it's, how do you advertise? And so, you know, the sit Barry's sister properties is one of the, uh, Apartments.com is another one. Talking Tony. Get Boy, Mr. Mr. Reed, we're losing you. We're ties to you're, um, get the people in. We're getting some breakup on your 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 um, um, voice here. Why don't you go back about um, sure. five sentences, and maybe we can get you again. So you were just oh you, you were talking about <laughs> something, beyond, <laughs> something beyond something uh, beyond um amenity selection and quality of, of the oh, features. Yeah. Okay. So design the place and, and fit it out, then it's marketing. And the marketing right. is you don't go and stick it up in a pack or that you mass you, you know, one of my examples was, you know, I think it's the assistant lacrosse coach at UMass had out to 70 wasn't any occupancy there. And so we sent her over to one university drive south. A, and those are apartment. Main, those uh, apartments are. At wow. It's. No, it's Is anybody else having trouble hearing Mr. Reedy? Yes. That's, I'm getting, I'm getting lots of, Let me I'm stop getting all sharing. yes. I'm getting all head shaking, yes. Uh, perhaps uh, for the time being, maybe you should off your video, or maybe you're using a lot of. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is factual, but you, you probably have a lot of um, documents that have a lot of um, graphics. Maybe if you could click out of some of them, I don't know if that would be helpful. I think that's exactly what's happening. I've got a lot of these. Them if. And in, in if all else fails, maybe the um, worst case scenario is to reboot your computer. Always seems or I could just call in too. How's this? Is this? So far, so better? good. Okay. So far, oh. so good. Oh, so you No, I hear it again. You know, Mr. Reedy, um, I think it's important that we be able to hear your whole sentence and not just every other word. Um, well, can you, why don't you try calling back in and we'll just okay. wait for, we'll just wait for a second. Um, everybody can go grab a glass of water and, and <laughs> call and call back in.
Well, Mr. Roberts, um, while we're waiting for Mr. Reedy, perhaps uh, you you actually manage lots of units in town, lots of rental units. Perhaps you can talk with us a little bit about your philosophy, how you implement tenant selection as well. I mean, it seems to me that the first cut is price. That's determined a lot by amenities, by features, by the quality of the building material, all everything else that determines price. That's the, um, sort of the first cut. Yes. I would I would suggest holding off until Attorney Reedy comes back, just out of respect of making sure that their whole team is 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 here. Well, I don't think it's I'll wait a while, but I'm. I don't see. Oh, he's on um, attendees, Maureen. Mr. Just, he, he just got on. There we go. Hey, Maureen, do you want to make me a panelist? How's this? Perfect. Okay. The old shut off reboot. Great. All right. You're coming in loud and clear. You can continue. Good. Mr. Reedy. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, so uh, I was saying that the, the first step to tenant selection is really project design of finish selection, amenity area selection, et cetera. And then subsequent to that, it's marketing. And it's, it's not necessarily sticking up on a tack board at UMass, you know, rooms available, units available. It's going through different channels, apartments.com, um, word of mouth, it's working with the university, whether it be Tony Maroulis or the athletic department. Uh, it's working with Amherst College uh, to try to get some of their professors, uh, graduate students, et cetera, uh, to be occupants. And so that's one of the, probably the best ways is, is the marketing um, of successful tenant selection because you have to be careful with tenant selection not to discriminate uh, based upon who is applying. And so if you're able to elicit the right responses, then the tenant selection process, um, you know, it, it does take experience that I'm sure Barry can talk about, but then the tenant selection process helps to work itself out. And then it's um, background checks, reference checks, ensuring financial adequacy, uh, and then really Barry using previous management experience, you probably get a good read of whether or not folks are going to fit well into the community that is looking to be created. And then after tenant selection, I'm getting a little bit into management, it's, it's the lease. And we've got a pretty robust lease with some pretty, um, uh, pretty clear expectations. I think it's page five of the lease for disturbance and, and noise that lays out all of the different ways, uh, some generally, some specifically, how a tenant could be evicted. And, it, and it, if nothing more, it really puts the tenant on notice of the behaviors that are expected. And then there's needs to be follow through. And that kind of all comes in with communication. And you know, if you look at by way of example, you know, owner occupied versus non-owner occupied, um, owner occupied tend to be better managed because there's there's a sense of community and ownership and um, you know folks who care about the property are there and they're talking with you know for example the other side of that um, duplex owner and I think what Barry has found successful and I'll and I'll stop talking a minute and let him talk about it but it's staying in touch with his tenants and whether it's 
responding to an issue like a, a toilet or a lockout, um, setting expectations, and then and then following through to make sure that they know he's not an absentee landlord, which is, I think, where you find a lot of the issues. And so tenant selection as a discrete idea is literally just getting applications and trying to select a tenant. But there's a lot more that go into it than just that piece of the process. Mr. Roberts, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think that one of the things that Tom points out that we have to be very careful that we don't discriminate. So we set out the expectations about, uh, you know, the financial capability, the expected behavior, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it, it's a slippery slope. So you have to be careful. And uh, we've been fairly, we've been successful so far in uh, being able to manage it. I think as you, you started to mention, uh, Mr. Judge, that, you know, the price determines some uh, of the ability of people to be in the project. We require uh, for most, um, if they are an undergraduate student, usually they do not have um, the wherewithal on their financial statement to show that they can afford an apartment. So we require uh, a parent or guardian signature on the lease and, and they actually become party to the lease. So one of the one of the things that I found was really positive in the management was the the um, the management plan that you have is that you speak about trying to be part of the you being the, the applicant not you personally um, be part of the neighborhood an appropriate type you want to have an appropriate mix of tenants and I'm wondering um, a couple of things number one. It's, it would be good to know how that works to respond to some of the concerns of the neighbors. It would be good to know how well that works and how successful it is in having a mix that's not dominated by just one type of tenant, whether they be a student or they be uh, seniors or whatever, whatever mix you want, but that there's a, that there is a mix that you speak of in, in your, your plan, that there is a mix. And one of the ways to do that is to report the um, to the town and on an annual basis the number of students, the kind of the, the, the demographic mix of the people living in your in your um, development. There um, is that something that you would be. I mean, I'd be very interested in, in learning that. I think that helps us as a town in future developments. It helps let's evaluate whether it's these kind of developments do indeed bring in a mix of uh, an appropriate mix of 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 both students and um, non-students faculty seniors others and affordable and affordable units as well and i so i think that would be a really positive thing for to come from this um, um proposal and i'd like to know whether this is something that you would um, agree to as a condition so it would be a report on an annual basis with the number listing the the, the um, occupations or the the demographics of I don't know what the right word is, but of the of the tenants, so that we know if we're successfully achieving the kind of mix that we want in, in these neighborhoods. Well, I don't have a problem doing that as 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 far as it's legal to do. I mean, I yep. think it's like a street list. It gives usually the name of the person and their occupation. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not opposed to supplying any of that information as long as it's legal for me to do so. And I deal to Mr. Reedy to tell me what, yeah. how much I can do and how far I can go, you know? Yeah, and I think, I mean, depending upon what's in the information, I think as you've described it, Mr. Chair, it's probably fine. and understanding what the town, what the data is that the town is looking for, I don't see an issue um, having that as a condition. 
Mr. Moore, do we, does, this, does that raise any problems that you can see for the town to try to collect that kind of information and then use it for helping us make decisions about other projects in the future? No, I do not. In fact, I actually uh, had this conversation with our town attorney specifically around this question. And, uh, you know, we believe that it's appropriate for the board to ask uh, through a condition of the permit to have the applicant report on, um, you know, the, the, the type of tenants that exist in the, the, the development specifically, uh, you know, those that are undergraduate students. And I think if we can uh, craft a condition that gives us, you know, the ability to work out with Mr. Reedy, the specifics of that request, uh, but knowing that, you know, we are, um, you know, as part of that, uh, very much interested in uh, the, the number of units that are occupied by students. And we would also define what we uh, would like to include, what, what a student would be uh, in, that, uh, in that type of reporting. Uh, so we think that's perfectly a uh, appropriate request. Good. Well, Maureen, let's, um, let's work on a condition for next meeting to put that into place. And you can work with um, the applicant to make sure that everybody agrees on the language. All right. Um, are there any other, one of the things that we, I think we should cover at this point is we had asked the town, I'm gonna to interrupt Mr. Reedy's presentation. One of the things that we did ask the town for was um, an assessment about whether we could limit the number of we could impose a limit on the number of students in the uh, uh, as a condition of the uh, of the um, application uh, number of students that are living in the property. And the advice we got from the town attorney is that that is it isn't clear yes or it isn't a clear no. But the advice is that it is not it is not warranted. It is not a um, wouldn't be wise for us to try to impose that upon the client, the client, I mean, the applicant. The applicant could may be able to do it if they, on their own if they felt comfortable that would be their judgment but and if they would agree to a limit that would be something that we could impose but a non agreed to uh, per se condition that we imposed on the on the applicant without their agreement would raise uh, could raise some real issues that we probably do not want to get into um that was a surprise to me and i but i defer to the judgment of the town attorney um, perhaps, Mr. Mora, you, I know you've had the conversation with the town attorney, you may want to um, expand on that, but I, that's what I take away from the, uh, the warning that we were given by our town attorney. Uh, yes, I, I think you captured that really well. And, you know, as I think, um, you know, indicated by the applicant, uh, there's a real uh, concern to be careful not to discriminate against a particular class of uh, potential occupant and the, the advice, although no legal precedent in this uh, exact question, uh, the advice is to uh, stay away from these types of conditions that would either limit or, or prohibit, uh, say a student from living in a development uh, to be careful not to inadvertently uh, uh, violate uh, fair housing uh, law, state or federal. And, uh, you know, that, that again, is the uh, town attorney, I think, giving us uh, wise advice and, and caution. Uh, and, you know, I think puts the emphasis on there's just as much of a concern from the developer or landlord standpoint as it would be from the town, uh, town standpoint of imposing a condition like that. So, uh, you know, with that in mind, we, we feel like we're, we're probably best to do what we always have done is focus on conditions of the permit that will help regulate uh, and, and, and be enforced or enforceable uh, because we feel like a condition such as limiting the, the number of students in a development would, would not effectively be enforceable, uh, either by my office or, or probably not even likely supported by a court if we were to uh, you know, go through the time and expense of trying to do that. You know, at least at that moment, this moment, that's our uh, the best advice from our town attorney. Ms. Parks. 
I'm just wondering if there is an intention to just have one person per bedroom and one person per studio unit, um, because by increasing the number of units from 17 to 22, if you allow four in each, you're actually increasing the possibility of 88 occupancy now from 68. And so I'm just wondering if the intention is to do that. If there's a three bedroom, is the intention to have three people or is that not going to be a limit? And the same thing with the studio. Yeah, so if I could, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Reedy. Thanks. Um, yes, that's the intent, but I don't know that we would say that is absolutely going to happen every time. Um, if you've got a family and it's a three bedroom, but there's four people, you know, we run into an issue there. If there's a studio and there's a couple, maybe there's two people in a studio. And so I think we had a similar conversation at one university drive South where, and, and it's, it's not the intent to put four people in a studio. So could, could four people be in the studio? Yes. But you know, what would that be? You know, parent, parent and baby twins maybe. So I, I be careful about, how, you know, and I'm not trying to be flipping. I'm just thinking, of when conditions are imposed here to them and to say one per studio, you know, I just want to be sensitive to that. I, I hear you and just would say, can four unrelated people live in a studio? I mean, technically yes, but practically probably, I mean, four unrelated, are, I, would, I would think we'd be fine with I'd have to think about a bit of condition saying that four unrelated could not live in a studio. I mean, that's not, it's not the intent to, to pack folks into here. I mean, and hopefully that's clear through the balance of everything else that we're doing. Understand the, the questions and thoughts, but when you look at the total product we're looking to, that's not the intent. And it might just Mr. be the Mara, lawyer in okay. me that needs to get restrictions. Yep. Mr. Mara, can I see your hands up? Oh. Um, you know, understanding Mr. Reedy's comment, I, I just want to state that uh, the zoning bylaw defines family a number of different ways. Uh, one specifically is in section 12.173. Uh, anyone who wants to follow along with their bylaw, a group of individuals, re, um, I'm sorry, 12.172, a group of individuals not to exceed four residing in a dwelling unit. Uh, so the applicant could agree to a condition of a permit that occupancy is defined by 12.172 for a particular unit size shall not exceed, you know, more than, you know, two, three, whatever the appropriate number is. So uh, that in no way would, uh, you know, create a problem for uh, a, a group of um, individuals that are related uh, living there uh, in the examples like Mr. Reedy gave. So that's just an alternative or an option to um, address Ms. Park's uh, question and concern about uh, four unrelated individuals living in these smaller units. I think this is actually something the board has, I know this is something the board has done on uh, in permits in the past. And that could be enforced through the lease as well. Um, Correct. That the lease could limit the number of people pursuant to our bylaw to that smaller number than four for a studio apartment. Yes, it could. Yeah. Mr. Reedy, did you understand what Mr. Morris said and, and, and the concerns of Ms. Parks? And would that be yeah, something I mean, that I don't, I don't, we can I don't work see on? I don't see an issue. I know it's not your intent to have. I, I I can't believe it's your intent or the intent of the applicant to have four people, four unrelated individuals, in a studio or one bedroom apartment. Um, it can happen with a family. We understand that that may be the case, but I, I doubt that that's what you want. And I it's probably in too much use. So can we work on this to uh, use that uh, part of the Absolutely. bylaw to Absolutely. give us more um, comfort? that we won't have overcrowding in some of these uh, smaller units. I take that as a yes. Yeah, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, I was okay. <laughs> all right. Ms. Parks, does that solve your problem in this case? 
I think so. I just, I'm reading the bylaw, but um, so how, uh, tell me how that relates that it's for, so for a dwelling, you would limit it to a family or related? How, I, I guess I'm just wondering about the wording of that. Mr. Mora, I see your hands up. Help us out here. Yes, yeah, so in the definition of family, uh, there's there's four options. One of them, 12.172, a group of unrelated individuals not to exceed four. So that's the, you know, always talked about four unrelated regulation. Yep. Uh, what we would say in a condition of this permit uh, as agreed to by the applicant that uh, for occupancies, defined under section 12.172 for studio apartments, there shall be no more than whatever number of occupants that, you know, that number is. Uh, and that would be a condition of the permit and ensure us that in those unrelated group living situations, there'd be no more than, let's say it's two. I don't, I'm not sure what the board is, you know, going to yeah. decide on, but whatever that is, insert the number. To that to that condition and that would be the way uh we would uh, regulate that and that would be an enforceable condition okay okay so that would be if you were to say two unrelated then you could still have a, like a family member you, you could have someone with a child and a roommate still yeah well because under a different section of that family definition you know the group the group may be defined differently so we're looking at specifically 12.172, which is a group of unrelated individuals. Okay. And I think that's what I was, um, I, th I thought I understand your, uh, understood your concern to be is that a group of unrelated individuals, not those that are related uh, in some other way as defined in the bylaw, but a group of unrelated individuals uh, having four in a studio apartment uh, may seem to be too much. Uh, although may be allowed by law, uh, may be too much, and uh, this would be an a way to regulate that with the agreement of the applicant. Okay, would the applicant be agreeable to that? Barry wants to talk, but I would think so. Mr. Roberts, what I wanted to say was that when they apply for an apartment. They're saying how many people they want to occupy the apartment. Then we put it in the lease. Let's say it's a studio apartment and uh, a couple wants to live in that studio. Then we know and we write into the lease, it will be no more than two people occupying this apartment. So it's pretty much self-regulating through the application process because we're asking that question. Who is going to be on the lease? Who is going to be living in this apartment? So, and if they start to bring in other people as they live there, we learn about it and we say you're in violation or at least you can't do them. So it can be a condition of the lease. We can use it as a condition on the, we can impose it as a condition of the application and it can be, um, and, and you're representing that it will be used as a condition of the lease. You can limit the number of people and various limits depending upon the size and the number of uh, bedrooms in a specific uh, apartment correct correct absolutely okay so i think we understand that does that that i think that addresses the concern you have miss parks okay all right we'll work on that as a condition and reference the that the lease will also address that Any other questions regarding tenancy management, uh, tenant selection management, that, things that we've talked about? I had one other one other thing that I wanted to raise. Um, and what, one of the things I'm, I'm pleased with in this lease is the desire and the, the I think the very good um, discussion with the neighborhood and desire to be, um, to add to the neighborhood, not to change the character of the neighborhood, to recognize that students are part of students undergraduate students are not going to be excluded from this property they're part of life in amherst they're certainly part of life as you get close to, the, to umass it's just that's just a fact of life and the neighborhood around there has had a number of undergraduate students living either in the 
the frat house down the road or in some of the own, un, non-owner occupied units and also in some of some owner occupied units but it is predominantly a family it's still a predominantly a family neighborhood and the look and it's desirous to maintain that family neighborhood one of the things i'd i'd like to discuss with that with you mr reedy is perhaps in the management uh, plan that you provided some kind of statement about an aspirational goal to keep that to continue that in more a more fulsome language something that talks about um, wanting to wanting to try to uh, achieve a mix of students and seniors and faculty members and everything else and some and wanting to report to the town and at some point having a number that is aspirational, not locking you in, not limiting you, but something in the na nature of 33% is to see if that makes sense as, as a, uh, a goal that you will look towards to see if that works with the neighborhood. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to limit you to that because I don't think that's going to work um, from a host of legal perspectives. But I, I think it would be interesting if we could work out something that talks as, as you're as, aspirationally and that you can look at this and see if it works with the neighborhood readjust as it goes down the road. And I'm not trying to, I'm not, a, I, I understand the desire not to lock into something, but I also think it's important to talk about and to put on paper sort of the philosophy that we've all talked about here in these last two meetings. And if I, if I could respond to that, Mr. Chair, yep. um, I, I don't think we have any problem with identifying it as, as an aspirational goal. I would be very hesitant to put any number in there, aspirational or not. These are public records. Uh, yeah, you know, and the, the legal mind to me says, wait a second, if it says 33%, does that then become a quota? And is somebody going to have an issue with that? So, you know, if you look at the first paragraph to our management summary, maybe we can expand on that a little bit um, with some more goals for the neighborhood. So what I will do, um... I've, I didn't successfully draft something up, so I don't have it prepared for tonight. I will submit that for the record. And it's something that you can take a look at and submit it and all members of the board will get a copy of it. They can look at it for the next meeting. Uh, but in, it is something that can be negotiated over the next, you can look at, you can suggest changes over the next a couple of weeks. Uh, and we can review those suggestions at the next meeting. If that would make sense. My goal here is to have some kind of a statement that looks towards not not changing the neighborhood, recognizing the current kind of um, mix in the neighborhood and continuing that mix through this new development. Sure. All right, good enough. Any other questions on tenancy management? How about um, we review, review the lease provisions regarding noise and disturbances described on page five of the lease and further detailed in the additional tenant management document. So if we go to the lease on page five, just you're gonna have to bear with me for a second and with all the other members of the board as we go through the large number of papers to find the lease. Here we go. Okay. Mr. Moore, can you walk us through some of the concerns that that we had about, I think this was raised, I'm not sure who raised this before, but, uh, or maybe Maureen, you can help us with uh, the review of the lease provisions regarding noise and disturbances. What was the issue here? Uh, Mr. Judge. Um, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think I had a specific question if um, the applicant's willing to address in the additional information submitted, uh, you know, the applicant emphasizes mm -hmm. uh, that in, you know, in, in illegal noise or nuisance uh, violation oh. constitutes a breach of lease. And I thought it would be really helpful because, you know, I understand the realities of that. You know, we deal with this a lot. Uh, and I thought it would be really helpful to get into the record, uh, perhaps by Mr. Roberts, you know, what really happens or what, what is the expectation here? Um, because the plan doesn't really describe, um, you know, what will occur when 
a breach of lease is, is determined. You know, I can't imagine that, you know, one noise disturbance, uh, one gathering, although technically a breach of lease will result in a seven day notice and, uh, you know, eviction process that's indicated in the enforcement provisions of this lease as well. So I, I think it's just, you know, what, mm -hmm. what does the, the applicant, you know, how does the applicant kind of approach these types of situations and what would we expect? Barry, I think, go ahead and just explain how it happens. Usually, uh, if, um, and I have, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, received noise complaints before. My first call is to the tenant and say, you're having a, 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 I have a noise complaint. I want it, you know, to be changed, the behavior to be changed right now. My second call usually is to uh, Mr. Laramie, who was the liaison officer for the town and tell him that I've received the complaint and that I will be uh, calling the tenant and visiting the site. Um, and then if it escalates past there, we will uh, give the tenant a warning. And then if they don't, like if it happens again, then we're on to the seven day notice uh, and ask them to leave. So does that get, do those notices get reported to the town currently, Mr. Roberts or Mr. No, Reedy, uh, or do they get to? I, I think every Monday morning you can read the report of noise compliance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that is, has been filed and it, it is by address. Um, so if it raises, comes to the level where the police visit the site, then it becomes a noise complaint. I believe, I believe that's the criteria. But as far as me calling in and I usually speak with uh, Mr. Laramie and say, I realize there might be a call from a neighbor, but I want you to know that I'm headed there or if I spoke with the tenant and asked him to control his behavior. So uh, I don't know, maybe Mr. Moore knows, when it ticks off that it gets recorded that there was a noise complaint. I'm not familiar with that. Mr. Moore, do you know? Well, yeah, I think any police response is recorded. You know, it's going to be in the discretion of the uh, officer responding whether or not it's a violation of the noise and nuisance bylaw and that, you know, that gets addressed and written into the uh, report by the officer. Uh, so that's, you know, it really is case by case discretion of the officer to make that decision. And is so if the management company handles it on its own and doesn't involve the police, the town doesn't know, wouldn't know otherwise know about it. Is that right? We, we wouldn't know about it. And I'm curious, uh, maybe for Mr. Roberts, yeah. you know, how are these these uh, complaints that he receives, are these recorded? Are these, uh, you know, kept throughout the duration of the tenancy? Uh, and, you know, are those records that are available if, if ever needed? And, and I'm asking that because I'm, I'm wondering if we work our way to a condition here on the permit, you know, having to do with, uh, you know, what Mr. Roberts just outlined, you know, by a third response related to a news and noisance complaint, a written warning is generated by a fourth response. The applicant exercises their uh, enforcement provisions for the seven day, you know, removal uh, as described in their lease. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, I'd like to see that get more formalized into writing uh, more reliable uh, for us to be able to expect what would happen. When we, uh receive a complaint, obviously we, we want to keep track of any issues with any individual or any individual property unit. So we do keep an internal log so that we can say, you know, just not relying on our memory of date and time and the issue. 
so that we record that so that if it becomes a pattern that we can we have the backup to be able to say this is why we're giving you a seven day notice would that be something that you could share on an annual basis with the town perhaps take off the names in a, you know, some way to protect privacy but is that something that you could on an annual basis compile and provide to the town that wouldn't be a problem would it mr roberts I don't have a problem with it as long as Mr. Reedy says it's not in violation of anything. You know, I just have to be careful. Yeah, no, I'm, I understand. I'm not asking you to put yourself in legal jeopardy. Mr. Mora? Oops, you're muted. Uh, I think in addition to that, you know, with a, a regular re reporting or that part of the report, I suppose, that we've already started to ask for for other information that uh, I'd like to see a condition that that written log be available upon request, you know, in an enforcement response by our uh, code enforcement officer, you know, in the in the situation where they are formal complaints that are registered with APD, uh, those mm -hmm. are provided to us. Uh, and, and, you know, if we had, you know, multiple uh violations that were recorded it, it would be useful for us to understand if the owner had additional non-reported uh you know instances that would help us decide where uh where the next step is for um trying to make improvements with the, either that occupancy or um the property agreeable to the, to the applicant, Mr. Reedy, Mr. Roberts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Maureen, yep. we want to work on that condition. Great. I think we've hit A, B, C, D, and E of the, and lastly is parking um, is the last issue. I know that's been some changes, Mr. Reedy, on parking. We had some questions about um, EV access and other things. Can you run through that for us? That would yeah. be, that'd be helpful. Sure. So uh, 42 total. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I had one. I had one. I, you know, I, I hate to do this to you, but I had one question on the lease. Just a second. I had outlined it uh, and it deals with parking. So that's great. All right. That's my question is about parking. Go ahead. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, 42 total parking spaces. Uh, and this is a kind of a system that worked at 70 University Drive. Uh, studios ones in two bedrooms will have one space for each of those designated. So that's 13 spaces, three and four bedroom units, two spaces designated for each of those. So that's 18 spaces. We've got an office space for the on site manager. Uh, and then there are three ADA accessible spaces. Those are not, those are just ADA accessible spaces. They are not attributable to tenants or visitors, they are just ADA spaces. And then we've got seven uh, visitor and what I've called ride sharing spaces. And so really, and I think what we want to do is probably designate one of those visitor spaces as a ride sharing space. And, and so the idea is an, an Uber or a Lyft pulls into the site. Uh, and this will be part of kind of that, that uh, occupancy package that a tenant gets so that they're not traveling off site onto Sunset Ave that so Uber is not picking them up in front of uh, in front of the units at Sunset Ave, but the Uber or Lyft can pull into the site. And so mm -hmm. that would probably leave, let's say, six visitor spaces and one ride sharing space, I think is what makes sense there. Um, and, and Barry can talk about the parking management system, I, you know, the, the stickers. And I think he mentioned it before with the visitors uh, being identified to the office staff. And then we would make this EV ready um so we would run the conduit we're not proposing an ev charging stations at this time uh we did receive some of that information i think mr meadows is the one who might have sent it to ms pollock um about the availability of funds and so i have an email into dep uh and eversource for these programs because they're first come first served so i don't even know if there's any funds still available to offset the cost of these charging stations. So what we'll do is we'll at least, and we're fine with the condition of running the conduit. And I think what we would appreciate as a condition is we'll explore. Um, but at least at this time, I just don't know what sort of funding mechanism is there to offset the costs of those charging stations. 
one of the questions I had is, will the will the parking spaces be assigned to an individual? Will each parking space have a number and be assigned to an individual unit, or will it kind of be come one, come all, and you you just have a space, and as long as you got a sticker, you can play, you can be any place in the in the parking lot. I think the latter, but I'll ask. I'll defer to Barry. Barry, how do you see this? That's how we work it at seventy. We just make okay. sure that everybody that's parking there has a sticker, and uh, you know it's first come first serve. And of course, if you have a uh, a tenant who has a handicapped a vehicle, a handicapped labeled vehicle, one of those ADA compliant spaces would be made available to them. I'm I would be some way that that would you must be able to work that out some way in the lease or to the agreement that that would be the appropriate place for them to park right yeah and i would have to look just at the legal of you know can we say you know reserved for so and so um or does it have to remain yeah. open you know I, if we if we can i think we would um right. but if we can't then we'll try to think of another mechanism okay um, I know, Mr. Meadows, you had some concerns about the EV system. Do you have any other questions about that or how it, the, the build up? No, I think the answer was was reasonable. If there's if there are funds available, would you commit to uh, to installing? Because I, I know that you can't get the funds if you just you're, you're going to have an expense to run the conduit. And anyway, if you put up the charging station, then you're eligible for funds. If you don't put it up, then you're, you've are you just spent money for conduit that is not gonna be useful. So the question is, would you commit to going ahead if there are funds available? I think um, likely, yes. I'd want to, cause I think there's some, uh, if you're accepting funds, there's an accessibility portion of this as well. And so I just don't know how that may change the layout. So you have our, for what it's worth, good faith effort that if we can make it work, we'll certainly make it work. Barry, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I think you've said it right. It, it seems to me, Mr. Meadows, that market forces are going to going to really demand that um, this is yeah. something that's provided. So I think if there is a, a condition that says you will make a good faith effort to do this, you've met the, you haven't been locked in if you can't get the funds or the market doesn't develop, you've met your concerns, I think about uh, a good faith effort that they're really gonna try to explore for those funds and will, and if they get them or the market forces force them to, they will put in the charging stations. Does that meet your, what you were concerned about Mr. Meadows? Yes, it does. Okay, so Maureen, we'll work on something that has language with the um, requiring a good faith effort on the part of the applicant. Mr. Mora, you have your hand up. Uh, just if the board would be comfortable with that condition stating that um, minor adjustments to the layout, uh, as Mr. Reedy stated, there would be you know an accessible aisle that would be, or, or clearances that would be needed to be maintained. Uh, for that uh, charging station space. So it possibly could shift or even eliminate a parking space um, to accommodate that. So it, it, I'm just wondering if, you know, to, to save the board uh, and the applicant time of resubmitting for any amendment in the future that, uh, you know, we would handle minor adjustments to accommodate a charging station. I'm comfortable with that. I don't need another meeting for something that would be just implementing our desire so um whatever kind of language we need to put into place on that uh, let's do that great um other questions about anything this is um, a good opportunity for us to ask questions about this before we go to public comment um mr chair do you want to see yeah. any of the floor plans so i don't know if you want jonathan to present because there, there were a couple of changes yeah, I, I think that'd be good Yep, because um, I've, I've reviewed them all, especially the the, the studio apartments and the uh, access to studio apartments. And the one of the things you asked Jonathan to highlight is the bike pat, the bike storage areas, because I, I know there was a concern about that. You didn't add additional outdoor ones, but you said there's enough room 
interior interior room for bike storage. So that would be helpful. All right, uh, your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, Jonathan Salvan, Cunital Architects, and uh, I think Craig has a, a his hand up. I don't know if he wants to ask his questions before I dive in. Well, one Great, of the questions was, was for you, Jonathan. So <laughs> I can wait until you talk. But I, it wasn't about layout. It was more. Uh, I noticed, as you indicated last time, you were you were talking about using an air-to-air -air system. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any pads or placement of where those would go uh, in the uh, in any of the. Um, sets of plans that we have been given. Um, we, well, go, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Is there, did I miss it or? No, um, we, we were somewhat scrambling to, uh, to update some of the drawings, um, but the intent is actually not to pad mount them, but to building mount them on, um, they're kind of like little shelves that'd be up about 18 inches off the ground. Uh, and they would be in the, in those enclosed fence areas behind the, the building in each of the so I, I'll, I'll point about, to the general location of it. you're talking about duck heat pumps there yes if if we go that approach um but to, to give you a, a little bit more robust kind of answer is last time we had talked briefly a little bit about whether uh a, you know a ground source uh you know approach would be appropriate here and we're not necessarily precluding that um what we want to do is as new construction and and predominantly apartments, well, not predominantly, at least 50% apartments now. Um, actually, no, we are more apartment buildings than, than uh, duplexes. Uh, we're gonna work with our HERS rater to try to hit the, the most efficient and most cost-effective in the form of rebates. And if we can, we can, if we can make that work with a, with a ground source, we can eliminate this um, need mm -hmm. for, the, for the outdoor condenser. Um, but that's, that, that work is a little bit downstream uh, of, of where we are with the development at least on the architectural and, and, and building system side. Um, but if we do have them, they'll be in those enclosed areas and I can try to highlight that as, as I walk through. Is that, does it help? Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Tom, if you could bring up those images, those drawings. I don't know if you want to, because I don't know that folks want to hear my choppy voice again. So if you've got- well, them, no, if, you, if you can bring them up, I'll talk to them. I'm. I'm Totally glad. Oh, 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 oh. I see yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be better. Yeah. John, if you I'm could, good. Jonathan, if you could do it, I, I think it'd be better if you could share your screen. If I, I give, give me maybe one minute, uh, and I will do that. And if I get choppy, then we'll, we'll, we'll have to uh, get creative here. Um, one more. We'll have to do. If, if you get choppy, we'll have to go old school. And actually, pull out pieces of paper and look at them and just hold all them together. <laughs> yes, exactly. we'll have to look at them all together and go through it. And it's one of the uh, disadvantages of Zoom life is that it would be easier if we were all in the same room to do this. So, so what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to. So this will be a little choppy in a different sense. I'm only going to bring up one set at a time so to to reduce the possibility that I'll make myself yep. uh, <laughs> choppy. So there'll be a little pause while I have to put one PDF away and bring another one up. Um, and let's make sure everyone can see this. Can you see a uh, drawing sheet? Yes. Okay. We can and we hear you. Very good. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the, the, the type A building. Um, and just to kind of uh, refresh everyone's uh, memory back to the beginning of Tom's presentation, um, that now consists of three buildings. One here at the corner of Fearing and Sunset, uh, one kind of in the middle on the front row, and then uh, a one building uh, in the back row um, in the southwest uh, corner. If I'm keeping my orientation straight in my head. Um, this this unit type didn't really change much, but I just for consistency, I'm going to walk through it. Um, again, this is just a quick view. Doesn't have all the pretty landscaping uh, that that Andy Bones drawings have. Um, but this is a view of a typical uh, type A duplex unit. Again, this is two four bedroom units. Um, I'm going to skip the really tiny ones and try to zoom in a little bit here. Uh, is that big enough? Let, let folks know. Let, feel free to tell me bigger or smaller. Um, that works for me. Okay. So on the left here, this is the 
the basement level, um, which uh, kind of contains the, the mud room, a laundry space. Well, it's a mud room for the, the folks that are on the fearing or on the sunset um, side of the uh, parcel, um, but really just a laundry room or access to the garden space in the back for the, um, for the folks who are on the parking lot side. Um, but here is one of those, you to each, each, under each unit, there's a, a larger area of unfinished space. Um, and this is obviously gonna have some building utilities in it, but it could also be bike storage. It's a really good place for bike storage. Um, so each unit will have access to, um, and this goes throughout all our building types now, they will all have some access to indoor uh, bike storage and obviously storage for the other things of life. Um, uh, moving up to the first floor level, so along Fearing Street, uh, you know, you would have a front door, uh, not Fearing, a uh, front door along Sunset, um, either entering here or here off uh, our porches, uh, a, an open uh, living dining kitchen space, a, a, a full bathroom at this level, uh, access down and access up uh, from this location. I'm now gonna scroll down and hopefully not make people sick as things move. Um, and again, as duplex, as the duplex units are, are designed, there are four bedroom units on either side. So there's a, a large uh, uh, bedroom with a walk-in closets, um, a, a second bathroom, and then three uh, smaller bedroom spaces, each with, the, with their own combination of closets. Um, and both sides are really mirror images of each other the units themselves are offset so that we can develop the architectural character that, that we were working with uh, when we were meeting with the um, local historic district. Oops, I'm sorry that this is popping back and forth. Um, so this is the, the front elevation. So on sunset, this faces sunset. Uh, and on the, the back row, this faces the parking lot. Each unit has its own uh, entry. Uh, the duplexes, Again, working with the local store commission are set up about 30 inches from, from the grade, or at least the first floor is set up 30 inches from the grade uh, to kind of uh, replicate um, that sort of traditional uh, single family home, uh, historic uh, home uh, kind of proportion, you know, how the, how, how the buildings sit on their, on their land. Um, this is the right side that kind of shows the, the land tapering away uh, with our grade. This is the rear elevation. So for the folks on Sunset, um, this is their back door, which would have a, you know, the ability to kind of function as a mudroom as you walk in as well. And then lastly, uh, here on the, this is the left side of the building. And then, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, open up my next one. Oh, no, I'm well, sorry. Before you leave, I had, I had one quick question. Questions. Yep. 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 I have one quick question. Yeah. Yep. So does this have two full, do these units, the, the duplex units have two full baths, including yes, a shower? Correct. Is that what I'm, I see a shower on the first floor? Yes, that is correct. All right. So you have a, you have a bathroom upstairs and a bathroom downstairs, full, both full baths. Okay. That's, and I've done you. a number of iterations. Yes. I just wanted to check on that. The, the downstairs one will have a shower as we're currently configuring it. And then there's a, there's a, a bathtub shown on the, on the, the second floor. All right. Thank you. Well, and I'm going to apologize. Uh, we might have a slight interruption. My 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 ten year old just came back from track, and I can hear him. So give me one moment to to let him know I'm home, uh, but that he needs to be quiet. <laughs> one moment. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there we go. Good. My my apologies. My wife's working till nine tonight, so I, I I'm doing lots of juggling and, and uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, things at one time. Okay, so all right. Sorry. That's the only question I had on that. Yep. So that's building type A. Thank you. Yep. So I'm Any stop other questions that members one? on building type A? All right. Good enough. And now, oops, now I got to open up my other one. Give me a moment. Yeah. Ms. Parks yeah. has a question. Oh, Ms. Parks, I didn't see. I'm sorry. 
That's okay. I just have a quick question about the the walkout space in the basement. Could that potentially become a living room? I know it couldn't be a uh, bedroom. Yeah, but... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh, that's I, the way I'd be a, a question for 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 Barry. It wasn't the intent to develop more space. Um, you know, there is a certain uh, balance between the amount of space we finish and the affordability of of the the units. Um, mm -hmm. If you get too large, uh, they they become more complicated. One okay. moment. Benjamin, this is a meeting. Daddy, I need you to, I need you. don't want to cook this cold. <laughs> okay. Hey, look, go, go. It's cold. You microwave it. Have that Daniel help you microwave it. <laughs> uh, best laid plans. Um, so it, what is, what's sorry. the ceiling height downstairs? Is it eight, uh, feet, eight foot? Yeah, I mean, we want it to, we don't want it to feel um, unpleasant when you're using it for the laundry, which will be the, yeah. which will be down there in these. Uh, so it will have uh, an eight foot ceiling. And, and the, the mudroom laundry area will have a finished ceiling. I don't think we would finish those, those other spaces with a ceiling. Um, it'll depend on where we put the insulation and, you know, some of the other details that we're still working through. Does that answer the question? Yes, okay. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Other questions or should I move on to the next building type? If there's no other questions, you can move on. Okay. Let's see, share that one. See what comes up directly. You should be seeing building type B. Let me know if you're not. And were there many? What were the changes in type B, Jonathan? So, so B, B previously was that what Tom described as that three bay wide unit, and yep. so it's it's this is basically <laughs> a, a a complete redesign of that. We we started yep. with the A type footprint, um, and instead of having uh, a duplex units, four bedroom duplex units, we went which are essentially like townhouses. We went to a, sort of a, a flat. Uh, approach and, mm -hmm. and thus the building became an, a small apartment building um, and so uh, we have two of these both in that that back area that faces the uh, parking lot um, and there's an example of well, one of them as Tom alluded as apartment buildings uh, we have to the ground floor units have to be accessible and ground floor in this case uh, has is defined as within three feet of, of grade so the the first floor units are what are called group one accessible. Um, and so there's there's that that ramp is kind of tucked in there. That's, this building has a very sloped, uh, low sloped pathway in lieu of a, a you know, a, a steeper steep, a steeper ramp. Okay, so moving into the details. Um, so instead of as was in the, the type A uh, building a, a basement with a, with the, the laundry and, the, and, a, and a mudroom, um, we actually have two units in, in the basement, two uh, studios. So uh, there's a studio here and a studio here. Um, they're off a, you're accessed off a common entry hall. Um, and the other kind of big change when we went from duplexes to an apartment building, we went from uh, each unit having its own stair uh, to a common stair that serves all the units. Um, and so, as I said, there's a studio at each, on each side of the, uh, the, the floor plate, uh, again, um, each with their own laundry uh, in the unit, an open uh, living, dining, in this case, sleeping space, uh, moving up to the... And is there is there um, a, a secondary egress out of the studio? So the secondary egress uh, is is up the stairs. So one way is... Okay, so you go out the door and up the stairs. Oh, got it. Okay. And then but just one door. The... Yep. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, and then moving up to the first floor level, we have a, on the, the right-hand side here, we have a two bedroom unit. Um, and, we, and the two bedroom unit is, is similar in layout to the, the former B, um, uh, but everything got it kind of reworked and, and, and redone. Um, so it's got an, an open living, uh, dining kitchen space, uh, a restaurant, a bathroom, full bathroom, 
um, and two bedrooms, one larger than the other, uh, and, an, and a laundry facility within the, the unit itself. On the opposite side of the hall, we have a, a slightly smaller unit, mm -hmm. uh, which is the one bedroom unit, um, but still with its own laundry, uh, a, a bathroom, and the open living kitchen dining space. And then if we move upstairs, it's really a mirror image of what we just saw on the floor below. On the right side, there is a two bedroom unit and on the, the, the left side, the one bedroom unit. And I'll All move right. to the elevations and I'll zoom in a little bit. Really the elevations are strikingly similar to the starting point of that, that type A building. Um, we did, uh, instead of having kind of an inset porch for one unit, both units have kind of a, a projecting porch, um, but otherwise the, the general appearance uh, will be very similar to uh, the, the type A buildings in their detail. So that's, that's our front elevation, All right. the right side, the rear, which now has a common entry point. Um, and I, if I moved a little too fast, some of these will have a slight ramp uh, down at that, that lower level to count for the grade. While our grade drops off a lot, it's especially, you know, well, we, these are only in the back, but it's not quite a full floor, but it's close to it. So we'll have a, a small six foot ramp, you know, all, all likelihood interior to the building in, uh, for those studio spaces or studio apartments. You know, Many anyway. has been fed. Okay, thank you very much. And then all right. the right side elevation. And I think that's it for this building. Let me just make sure I haven't lost the page. Okay. The, do folks have a question on this building type? Ms. Parks. Um, do you just, um, can I get the square footage of the studios? Sure. They, they vary a little bit in size. And we have some flexibility since they don't take up that whole uh, floor, floor plate space. Um, oh, and I didn't, I neglected to point out the, the bike storage spaces, but if, if you can see this, this area yeah. plan well enough, you can see the, the bike storage at the back. So we have a little, little flexibility here to make these bigger if we, if we choose to, but the small studio is uh, 375 square feet and the large studio is 515 square feet. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Dylan has raised his hand. Oh. Mr. Maxwell. Oh, Mr. Maxfield. Unmuting probably help. Um, there you go. Thank you. The uh, on the ground floor one that that one on the right there, the bike storage utility. Yep. Uh, what's the uh, what's the reason for that design? How it goes in narrowly and then expands out like that. Um, I, it was mostly just the, the, the way that it ended up kind of getting laid out. I'm trying to keep the toilet cores close to where the toilet cores are on the, the floors above. They don't quite stack, mm -hmm. um, but it would be possible uh, to have another configuration where either maybe this laundry was backed up to, to the uh, kitchen, for example. You're, you're looking, wondering, could we not get something that was a bit more irregular in shape? Yeah, um, just, yeah, just possibly, wondering the yes, choice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in, in this case, it was mostly that the bike storage and utility space was the, the space that was left over after kind of laying out a, a relatively um, efficient unit. Okay, so it was the unit came first and then, then the bikes were just left, left over. That's not because it needed to accommodate the layout of the utilities? No. Okay, thank you. Oh. Other questions or should right. I move on? Go on to the next one. I don't see any other questions. I'm going to stop sharing that one. And then in the background here, open our third one. And now you get to hear my cat in addition to my kids. <clears throat> OK, uh, so building type uh, C. From the exterior is, is very similar and, and partly from the interior is very similar to what we looked at last time. Uh, the, big, the big changes are really um, prior to this, the, the um, townhouse style units, which faced 
Sunset uh, only had access out towards Sunset. And so we have reworked this so that there is now the ability for those stairs to go down to that ground level and access the parking um, from the back. And we have only one of these as we did last time right here in the, the southeast corner of the site. And you've added the on-site management office as well. Yes. That's the, other, that's the other major change, right? Yes. Yes, I think last time we may have, I have done many iterations, but I, I believe the last, the last one we presented had two apartments down at this level. Now we're one apartment and the management space. The stairs as they came down took up a lot of, of uh, the space that had prior been uh, put towards one of those units. Um, so if I've moved into here enough, um, each stair that will make more sense from above uh, comes down to this level. Um, one of them acts uh, as a kind of, or connects to a shared entry that uh, allows you access to the two bedroom apartment that, that is down at this level with again, that open living dining space, um, uh, two bedrooms, one larger than the other, uh, restroom or bath, full bathroom over here. Again, a laundry space. Um, and then uh, on this side, on the left side of the page, we have that on-site management office. Um, it has access to its own entrance that's that's separate from the 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 more private entrances to the to the um, tenant spaces. Um, but this would still be a, a kind of a common space that all um, tenants could access because this is the the access to the bike storage, uh, which is in this area. Folks can see my cursor. Good. Moving up a level, um, really at this level and the level above, uh, the, the, the units are really unchanged. I do believe I, I may have, I do believe I mirrored the building from the last time you saw it. The three bedroom, I believe was on this side, on the right side the last time. Um, but as I was developing that, that, uh, um, that uh, the two bedroom unit in the basement and the management office, it really made sense to flip uh, the building has the stair configuration was more efficient to the layout that was working on the, the lower level. Um, so these, now are that, these are essentially unchanged from they're they're unchanged except that they they flipped and that the stairs yep. go all the way down. Um, again, the open living dining and kitchen space. This is now the three bedroom unit on the uh, left hand side of the page, then the very similar layouts mm -hmm. for the, the uh, four bedroom units uh, to the right. And then if we move up again, one more page, there's that three bedroom, second floor with a large bedroom and, and a walk-in closet, uh, a bath and two smaller bedrooms. Um, and then the two four bedroom uh, units, which while they vary a little bit, haven't varied since the last time you've seen them with a large bedroom um, in one of two different locations and then three smaller bedrooms around. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yep. Any questions regarding layouts from board members? All right. I will Thank stop. you very much, Jonathan. If Not at are, all. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. Um, Mr. Reedy, is there anything else that, involving changes that you want to make, or are there other questions that we have from the board um, before we go to public comment? All right. Um, I, I have I, a landscaping question, but is that yep. will wait that till next week or? Oh, no, you can do it right now. Next week. Go ahead. Yep. Um, simply the Arborvitae. Oh, that we discussed last meeting um, as not being pollinators. And I, I, I did check with someone who is deeply involved with pollinators. And it seems as though holly bushes would be a better idea than the arborvitae along the, that wall. They prevent a good barrier. At the same time, they are attractive, easily maintained, and uh, are good pollinators. Tom, do you want me to? Yep, go ahead. 
Inter- but introduce yourself first. I will. Yep. I got it. Um, so my name is Andrew Bone. I'm a landscape architect and principal of Place Alliance um, and the landscape architect on the project. Um, the, the diversification of, of plant material in this project is pretty intensive when you look at the um, when you look uh, at the plant list. So we we're looking for um, early season pollinators, uh, mid season. Uh, and even late season, um, and also looking at climate adaptation as well. One of the issues with the holly bush is that um, it, it's very susceptible to burn in the summer, um, <clears throat> where the more um, uh, a more a more rugged plant, um, specifically when we're looking for this heavy screening through this area, uh, would be the arborvitae. Um, and I, you know, I think I'm. Um, I'm comfortable with the fact that we have so much um, other plant material in here um, that that provides that habitat and that pollinator capacity um, throughout the year. And I guess I'd add the, the plants that are laid out in the plan are the plants that you intend to plant. What are the examples of pollinators and and how that you have? Sure. Um, so through through the different plant materials, we they're broken down into tree species, and those tree species provide um, a variety of flowering capacity um, at different times of the year. Um, so everything from uh, the simplest thing of an American redbud to uh, pagoda dogwood to the American sweet gum. Those are all, all very early season um, pollinators. And then you move into the shrubs, uh, the fragrant sumac, the nine bark, um, the hydrangea, uh, inkberry holly. These are all very, very um, flower producing, fruit producing um, plant materials. And then into the ground covers and perennials, um, you know, we have butterfly weed, uh, bearberry, um, the different fres- fescues and grasses are used for for the edible pieces of their uh, their um, their flowering heads. Um, we have black eyed season, little blue stem. All of these have you know the ability for foraging, um, pollination, um, food cover. Um, the kind of list goes on from there. One of the conditions that we always um, apply is that the landscaping has to be maintained for the design. And one of the one of the attractive things of this um, application is the is the really intense landscaping that is there. And that would be you, you would be required to maintain that uh, that good order. So. That's great. Craig, Mr. Meadows, um, do you have anything else you wanted to comment on that? I just wanted to make no, sure we understood no. what the other pollinators were. No, I, I understand. Uh, and I understand. I appreciate the effort to get a lot of other pollinators in there. I think it's it, it, it's very valuable to have them in there. Uh, but the arborvitae take up a lot of room. They are not particularly attractive. They uh, and they could be replaced with holly bushes that that uh, I, I've got holly around the house here, and I've never had any problem with burn on it. Um, so I would rather see those replaced with a pollinator than have them stay as they are. All right, I I would like to move to um, public comment. Oh, um, Dylan. I think Maureen. Dylan had a. Chair. Oh, Dylan. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, that went from two affordable units to three. What um, which types of units were going to be all the uh, the affordable ones? It's a great question. So um, we'll have that for you next time. It'll either be a, a, a studio, a one and a two, or two studios and a one, or um, one studio and two ones. So of those three. We just have to do a little bit more research to find out really what the what the demand is now. We had said before, 
between twos and fours, twos were much preferred. As you heard, I didn't say anything about threes and fours because those just there's really no demand in the affordable community for those. So let us get our house in order a little bit more, and then we'll come back with our suggestion. Got it. And, then, and Mr. Um, Reedy, you'll be working with. Oh, I'm sorry, Dylan. Go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, I was just gonna follow up with that. Um, I don't know, maybe if it was in there and I've missed it in the submissions, but I have the rent for the estimated rent for the four bedroom. What's the the estimated rent for the studios, the ones, the twos, the threes? Do you, do you have that in front of you? Yeah, so studios, so market rate, because affordable is going to be completely different. Affordable is like for studios, 700 for ones like eight to 900 and for twos, maybe like 11 to 1200. That's affordables for market rate uh, studios 1500 to 2050 um, for one bedroom 1600 to 2100 uh, for two bedrooms 2200 to 3000 uh, and three bedrooms 3000 to 3900 and then four bedrooms 3700 to 4500 and I think uh, Ms. Pollock did a great job in the project application report I think she called those out too got it yeah those are my questions thank you and of course, you am I right that you will work with um, the agencies to determine what that um, demand is for affordable housing as opposed to just making them available on your own judgment, right? Yeah, and, and so it's a it's a pretty, I'll say onerous, but I use that um, as mm -hmm. politely as I can. It's a pretty onerous process that you have to go through yeah. in order to get actually get these approved. So yeah, we'll work with probably SEB Housing, who we've worked with for One University Drive South, um, and then Gail Flood, uh, one of our team members, she is certified in affordable housing. So she really has her finger finger on the pulse, talks to Amherst Housing Authority, talks to Greenfield Housing Authority. So it'll be a well-informed decision. Great. All right. If there's no other questions from members of the board, I'd like to open this up to public comment. Um, Members of the public, if you wish to comment, please raise your hand. Uh, if you will, I, when you get recognized, identify yourself by your name and address for the record. Try to keep your comments to about three minutes. Um, and we'll see who, would, uh, and we welcome your, we open up the, um, the meeting to the public at this time. I'll just give people, just give them a minute. They've been uh, very patient going through the this process. We have one, it looks like, uh, Dorothy Pam. Um, Go uh, ahead, Dorothy. I, I, I want to comment. Oh, Dor Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street, uh, speaking as a private citizen. Um, I do want to, to thank the applicant for all of the changes that have been made. Um, I am also very heartened by the discussion about the lease and some of the conditions uh, that um, Rob Mora has been mentioning. And I, I have one more condition to suggest, um, which is to put in the lease that you can't use the basement as a living space. I mean, I'm sure there's a better way to word it, but um, you know, because there's some people say, I don't care, I'll, I'll sleep in a sleeping bag, but, but that, has, that should be in the lease that you cannot um, use that as a living space. Um, I would also add a comment about the arbovites. I had a big hedge of them that where they all died. They need a lot of sunshine. And um, I don't see that place having quite that much sunshine. And I, I agree, my holly bushes, which I have at the front of my house, are doing beautifully. Um, but they also really do pro pro provide a really good barrier. Um, I think that the, the rents are very, very high. The, the market rents are exceedingly high. Um, I think the affordables um, for the one bedroom, the eight to 900, that's, that's actually pretty good. Um, I think perhaps a studio, at least a small studio should be a little bit less if it's, if, if, but you're probably not, I mean, I think you're, you, can't, you can't put all the affordables in the same place, can you? Um, don't they have to be sprinkled around or? Um, yeah, Maureen says yes. Um, so there seems like an awful lot of thought and care about the way that the people, the residents will move about the um, lot. Um, 
The only thing I would add to Mr. Roberts' comment about how well his tenants at 70 University behave, they don't have a big common green. They have really almost no outside recreation space. And this has been, looks like a wonderful layout for a family uh, uh, apartment complex. But there's got to be, um, and I guess well, he'll have to really be really strong in enforcing it to keep the students from thinking they can party in that beautiful space, because that would be really destructive of the whole concept, as far as I'm concerned. But I look forward to seeing it looking forward. I think it'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pam. Um, Mr. Rosenthal, please identify yourself and state your name for the record and address. Thank you, sir. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. I, I want to first thank- Go ahead, Mr. Rosenthal. I want to first thank uh, Barry Roberts for the time he spent with the neighbors. We really appreciate his being there. I've known Barry Roberts for decades and I know he will- You're not, uh, Mr. Rosenthal, you're not muted. So, um, but we're not hearing you. I, I, I can we, we can hear him fine, Steve. Can you can you hear me now, sir? Let's see if there's. We can hear him. Nobody else that wants to be Steve, recognized at this point. Can you hear him? Steve, can you we, hear we me? Can hear. You can't hear me. I, we can I, hear you. We can. You okay. can't hear us. Can am I am I able to proceed? Uh, let's we, wait for Steve uh, for the. Now, can you hear me? We hear you. Do you hear me? So I, I'm saying, Maureen, Maureen, you take over running this until I can get my sound up. Uh, or let's... not running it, but identifying um, who, who should talk. And I'll uh, get I my, think we my should... sound going again. Well, I guess I... he can't hear me. I'm going to text Steve. Hold on, everyone. I'd be glad to come. I'd be glad to speak later on after you've got this resolved. That sounds good. Thank you, Ken. There we go. Can you hear us? Now I can hear you. Yes. OK. Yeah. All right, Ken, proceed. Can, can, you hear, can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm sorry to do that to everybody. All right. Thank you. What I was saying is um, I've known Barry Roberts for decades, and Barry does what he says he's going to do, and I think we really appreciate as neighbors having had a chance to meet with him. But I'm speaking to you now as a former member and chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which I was some decades ago, and it's been my pleasure or maybe displeasure to wander around town and see some of the consequences of things we thought we did well that turned out not to be so well because we may not have been specific about we, what, what we expected the developers to do. So it's wonderful to hear the aspirations of what Barry and, and Mr. Reedy say they're going to do, but I think you need to be specific in the conditions and I'm going to make some suggestions about that and I will try to be as brief as I can. For one thing, we appreciate the importance and he agrees with us the importance of having this development include workforce people, people who are year-round residents of Amherst, senior citizens perhaps, as well as young families and young faculty members at the university. This is his aspiration, and this is what Mr. Reedy has said. But now I think you need to include as conditions some of the things Barry Roberts has said he's going to do. For instance, we know that he speaks with the Office of Off-Campus Housing, Sally Lenowski at the University of Massachusetts. And I would hope that you would put as a condition that the owners of this property who will be somebody other than Barry Roberts decades from now will also seek to have their, their tenants come from uh, the, um, the workforce and therefore they will, they will and year round. So therefore that, he's be, that, the, that the owner be required to speak periodically with the University of Massachusetts graduate uh, departments and off-campus housing, the Chamber of Commerce, and the people in town hall who are responsible for, for uh, human resources so that we can encourage policemen, firemen, other people who work in town for the town and in, in, in the business establishments to, to reside here. The requirement that, not that he succeed in doing this, but that he seek their help in getting his tenants. Um, I, I, I um, know that you talked about 
the possibility of limiting the number of unrelated individuals in studio apartments to two. I think that same number two should apply to one bedroom apartments because they have the same effect as studio apartments. So there should be a limit there of no more than two unrelated individuals. I, um, I hope that um, the landscape, uh, which is so beautiful in the, in the drawings, really developed that way. But I think you need to have some minimum requirements for what goes in initially. For instance, there should be a minimum caliper of the trees that are installed from the beginning so that we don't have to wait 10 or 20 or 40 years for those trees to mature. Um, so I, 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 I go to the professionals to know what the minimum caliper should be, but it perhaps should be six inches or seven inches or so. Um, again, I, I appreciate very much what Barry Roberts is going to do. And I think we have to put into your conditions those kinds of things that you expect future owners who are not Barry Roberts to do just as well. And I thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Anybody else wish to comment? Okay. I thank everybody for their comments. Um, we'll go, this gives just an opportunity for the applicant to respond um, if they so choose. And, and after that, for us to either ask any further questions, discuss any kind of conditions, uh, and ha generally have a discussion about the project. And um, so, Mr. Reedy and Mr. Roberts, go ahead, and then we will move on to other questions from the board at, subsequent to that. Sure. Uh, thanks, Barry. I'll just go first, and maybe I'll steal all your thunder. I mean, as far as the first comment, uh, condition about not using the basement as living space, I, I don't see that as an issue. Um, I guess I would say in the family context, if they wanted to use it as a living space, you know, if we're talking about unrelated, if we're doing some differentiation, if we're talking about unrelated individuals, not using that as a living space, but families, you know, I don't, I don't know what living space is, something more than storage in those duplexes. Um, you know, I don't know if they have a playroom for their kids down there. So, that would be, I think conceptually we're okay with it. I think some differentiation would be good. And as far as Mr. Rosenthal's comments, you know, a condition that we have those conversations with the folks that he mentioned, I don't see an issue with that. It's it's uh, probably good practice. Um, first blush, I think that second, you know, no more than two unrelated in studios and one bedrooms is probably okay as well. Um, and then the landscaping, it's it's as per plan, and you've got all the different dimensions on the plan. And we think that those are, you know, as far as the volume of plants we have and the cost of the plants, I think you'll see, uh, and I can always ask Andy to, to support me here, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, those are some pretty good size plants to start with. So yeah, it'll, and Andy, those renderings that we showed at the beginning, you know, is after what age of growth do you think those are? Yeah, so there, there's a little bit of a variety in that, but we're trying to show what it'll look like um, about five years out. Um, but the the tree planting um, and size of the tree planting that's proposed to go in, um, there is some variety in that sizing. Um, and that's because of the actual landscape market right now, of trying to find the actual material to, to plant because of everything that's gone on with COVID. Um, so we try to give a little bit of, of, of flexible room in that, um, but even the minimum size um, of the trees to go in um, will be no shorter than somewhere between 12 and 14 feet tall for the shade trees. Um, if you get a really nice two and a half inch caliper tree, it could be upwards of 20 feet. Um, so <clears throat> we're trying to show the renderings um, not at maturity. At maturity, it will be um, highly maintained, fully filled out beds um, and hedges um, and trees that'll be upwards of, um, you know, 40, 45, 50 feet tall um, in the parking areas along the, the tree line um, and in the amenity space. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the board to ask any other questions, comment about conditions, and generally to discuss um, this before we move to continue this public hearing until a later date. So this is our opportunity. Let's take a few minutes to do that, and then we can move to the other business, the um, administrative meeting we have after um, discussion here. All right. Well, it looks like we don't have a lot of other things that need to be discussed. I think we've had a pretty, actually, I think we've had a pretty robust discussion uh, and, and good participation from most members of the, of the board and some members of the public. So at this point, um, I would move that we continue this public hearing until is it June 23rd, Maureen? The third. I think that's correct. I believe so. Let me just double check. Mr. Meadows. Oh, you're muted. And you're still muted. I'm out of the country from June 18th until July uh, 3rd. June 18th to July. Do they not have internet where you where you'll be? I could, I might be able to, it's possible. I can't say for sure. I'm going to Colombia. Well, I don't know if it's much going to be much worse than Mr. Reedy's internet was there for a while. So that's, that's what I'm being right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, can, can everybody else make the 23rd? I really hate to, to negotiate these dates at the public meeting, but let's, and if, it, if this date doesn't work and there's another date quickly thereafter that does work, we can deal with that at the next meeting, that we, next public meeting and move it again. But I think this would be the best that we, and that is uh, another month away. If you can get on Mr. Meadows, uh, that would be great. Um, and I'd like to try to move it to then, but I don't, and I'd like to rely upon your efforts to to call in for that night if you could. I shall make every effort to do that. And let us know if it doesn't work um, and see what we can do, but let's try to shoot for that. I think everybody else is available that time. Miss Pam, um, um, <laughs> Miss Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, you said yes. How about Mr. Gilbert? Yep. I, I believe so. And Mr. Maxfield? Yep. Okay. Like in the calendar right. already. We'll shoot for that. All right, so I move that we continue the meeting. I'll, I'll take a motion that we continue the meeting. <clears throat> the public hearing. The public hearings, exactly. Thank you for the correction, public hearing until June 23rd. I have a- At uh, six o'clock. At six o'clock. Mr. Maxfield moves, is there a second? Second. Ms. Parks seconds the motion. Any discussion um, requires an, uh, a vote. I chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Um, so the hearing will reconvene June 23rd. Thank the you next very much. All right. Thank you all for your work. The next, order of the next order of business is uh, election of officers for the ZBA. Um, there's three officers provided for in our um, bylaws, chair, vice chair, and clerk. Um, how we'll handle this is to um, receive nominations from the floor. The vote will occur on the uh, selection this is a majority vote. It's, uh, you need three to pass, not four. Um, and only full members can vote, but it's only full members are on the panel tonight. So that works out in self-selecting. So um, I think we should vote for chair and then vice chair and then secretary and then clerk. Are there any nominations on the floor for chair? 
Mr. Maxfield. All right. First question is, uh, you're not you're not leaving us, Steve, are you? Not you're right up. now. <laughs> not right now. Uh, so if, if someday we can ever actually get together again, that's <laughs> what I'd like to. That would be much better. Well, uh, unless I have no anybody, right now to leave, no. Unless anybody had a uh, coup plan for tonight, I'm going to go ahead and nominate Steve as chair. Second. Are there any other nominations from the floor? If not, uh, the vote occurs on uh, Steve Judge as chair of the ZBA. All um, needs a roll call vote. I'll vote for myself. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. All right. For the next office, of, officer is uh, vice chair. Are there nominations from the floor for vice chair? Or, or it doesn't even have to, you can nominate yourself too, or the volunteers, not just nominations from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> if you're foolish enough to nominate yourself. <laughs> Mr. Maxfield. I actually want to ask a uh, question here because John, we, we do lose you next month. Am I right about that? You're going to stick with us till the end of this um, application and then, and then you're gone. Uh, it's unclear. I applied for a planning board vacancy. So we're contingent on how that turns out. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, well, uh, given that we might be losing John soon, figure we might might as well give him the shot here if we wanted to stick with that uh, that three month structure of vice chair. Uh, do we do we all like that style? I, I I don't mean to just ram that through. Do we all like the idea of three month terms of vice chair? You know, I think that has it's not provided for in the rules and the way it can be done, and I'm not opposed to it being done. The way it could be done is just a gentleman's agreement that. After three months, you resign your position as vice chair and reelect somebody else. But right now, the the rules just provide for um, a during your term. So it could that could certainly be accomplished um, through an extra legal extra legal uh, process by um, a gentleman's or gentlewoman's agreement. But I I think it's fine if people would like to do that uh, and all have the experience of being vice chair and clerk for a while. I guess I guess that might. Oh, sorry. I don't yeah. want to dominate. You go ahead, Tammy. I was just going to say I like that idea, and uh, I nominate either Dylan or Craig to take on the vice chairmanship. <laughs> 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 so that would be Dylan. I nominate Dylan to be the next vice to be the current vice. Chair. All right, we got one nomination for Dylan and or Meadows, but Meadows said no, so. <laughs> Maxfield is on the line for this, unless unless all Gilbert seconds. can be unless Gilbert can all, all be uh, Maxfield. <laughs> I, I would love to. I would be on. I know he wants it. <laughs> all right. Okay. So we have one. Do we have two? All right. It looks like we have a nom We have one nomination for vice chair. I like the idea of alternating it every three months, and we'll rely upon your good. Um, good graces to do that. Um, are there any other nominations? If not, the vote occurs. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. And now we have the, uh, the clerk's the role of um, clerk as the last officer. Are there any, is there anybody who wants to fill this role? What is it? Do we have a description of the role? <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna. I was just going to get that role, uh, get that description out because I think the unfortunately named role of clerk. The clerk shall be a member of the board and shall, in the absence of staff assistance and subject to the review of by the chair, supervise all of the clerical work of the board, including reviewing all correspondence of the board, sending all notices required by law preparing rules and orders of the board, reviewing all applications for compliance with the rules of the board, keeping dockets and minutes of the board's proceedings, compiling all required records, maintaining necessary files and indices, 
If the clerk and staff assistant are absent, the chair shall appoint an acting clerk. It seems to me that the role of the clerk, that this is, that this is sort of legacy language in the days when we didn't have uh, the capable staff that we currently have uh, assigned to us as the ZBA. These are the kind of responsibilities that Maureen has handled well for a lot of this is what Maureen handles well for us on a day to day basis. And then working with Rob and others and Dave, we really have most of this covered. I guess this is kind of the role of the clerk would be to, I would guess, every now and then check in with Maureen and see that everything's working out all right. And if there's any, she needs any help or if there's anything that needs to be done, um, check in with it. But I think most of this is being handled, I think, satisfactorily by the staff currently. So my view of this is that it's kind of honorific uh, role. And um, I like to see somebody who's labored long and hard at this board have this. So Ms. Parks, um, you're due, a, you're due a title if you want one. <laughs> sure, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And, and you don't have to take it. We can just we can force it on, on Mr. Gilbert because he's going to be gone anyway. That's a point. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it. It's, yeah, exactly. I one of my least favorite things is taking meeting minutes, and every time I turn around, I'm in a position that's taking minutes again. So no, sure, no, you don't have to. You do not have to. Can we nominate Dave or Rob for this? Because <laughs> no? I, I'm, unfortunately, we can't. They have to be a member of the board, and they have to be a full member. Okay, um, Craig. Craig, are you no, thank, are you no, excited no, about this no, opportunity? No, no. John, would you like a, a, a something to add to your resume? <laughs> I mean, you can give it to me. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> they already had COVID. Like, what's the odds you're going to actually have to take minutes? Like, I think we're in. You're, you're not. You're not taking minutes. The, the thing is, if you if you take this now, it's something you're not going to get over in the planning board because you're oh. they're not going to give you this role right away. So yeah. put this on your know, you yeah. put this on your resume right now. And hell, you might even have to stay with us for another term. <laughs> John, yeah, you sure. I mean, okay. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> well, you got it. Okay. So um, that seems to me there's no other clamoring, not anybody clamoring for a nomination to that position. So the vote occurs on Mr. Gilbert as being our clerk. Chair votes aye. Parks. Aye. Parks re readily votes aye. Mr. Maxfield. <laughs> aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. You skated away without doing it. And Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go on. <laughs> All right. We've elected officers. All right. Um, I think it's great. Mr. Maxfield, I think it's a great idea to alternate every three months. I, I really like that. It gives people an opportunity. And I know that uh, in the next meeting, I've talked to Maureen about trying to have other people take an opportunity to chair um, an application. And so she's going to make sure that each of you um, get an opportunity in the near future to to chair, but take an application, run it all the way through as chair. In those cases, you know, I think it's a good opportunity for an, uh, also for a, an associate member to sit on the board. I perhaps will step off and let other people run, uh, but we'll work that through each of the the applications that come up. But um, we'll do this so that everybody has the opportunity. If God, not God forbid, but in the case, because I hope it happens that I'll be on vacation someday and won't be able to lead a meeting. So um, that would be handy for all of you. All right. So the next meeting is June 9th. June 9th. And you're talking to people about um, setting up other people to chair those applications, taking those applications and chairing them, right, Maureen? Okay. Yeah. So I'll okay. send each of you an email to see if you... Um would like to chair those um, three, uh, one of the applications. There's three applications total. One is related to a proposed flag lot. One is a variance, which I think we wanted Steve to handle that one because variances sometimes are just so unique. And yep. then the other one is a proposed duplex 
on a property that um, currently has, I believe, a single family home. So it'd be a single family home plus a duplex on the property would be the proposal. So I'll send Dylan and Tammy an email particularly to see if um, you would have any preference or interest uh, to do that, uh, chair that um, the, either of those applications. Great. So any other business, um, administrative business that members want to bring up at this point? All right. So I, I think the next thing to do is um, open up for public comment on any matter that was not before the board tonight. And we have two attendees, no hands raised, no hands raised from panelists. All right. No, there is no other business, no thing else on the agenda, no other business. It's not even nine o'clock. Um, so over the next month, I'm sure you'll be getting more information from the applicant on this prior thing, uh, the prior application that we were discussing, keep in touch with staff on that. And, um, Mr. Gilbert, I hope you hear from the planning board that they're full because we, we don't want to lose you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you bad luck with that. Yes, I, mean, I wish you bad luck with that. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't mean that. All right. So <laughs> do I have a motion to adjourn? So give you a motion. So moved. All right. I, I hear a second. The motion is not debatable. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. And not for long with us, Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> Potentially, I will give you an eye for the short term, however. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. We'll talk.